Hello there. You're watching Fairfield 2.0. Uh, I'm Mike Ragonia, some sometimes, and other times uh, my doctor tells me I'm other people. Uh, but today we have other people with us. Uh, we have Mr. Tim Britton. We have Mr. George Foster. And we have Ms. Sharon Bousquet. Okay. Um, and they, they are, what do, what do we say? They are very talented musicians, every one of them, yeah, like superlatively talented musicians, because that's what we do on Fairfield 2.0. Uh, we present some of the best talent in town, and uh, I think that, um, I know you're all modest and you don't want to hear stuff like this, but I am really a big fan of every single one of you. I, you drive me nuts how great you are on bass, and you're like, oh, that, that old thing. Um, and, and, and Tim, you're, you're amazing on, you brought, you brought the, the, the certain device over there that we'll be hearing from you. Well, actually, we'll be hearing from everybody tonight, today, wherever, whenever you're watching this. Uh, and Sharon, you're one of my favorite singers in town. I, I'm really looking forward to uh, what you got up your sleeve for the show today. Um, let's start. <laughs> it's like, what am I going to do? Um, I want to. I want to ask. Uh, let's start. Let's start all the way over there. Um, Tim, uh, Mr. Tim Britton. And of course, the language will go up on the screen. This is going to be so exciting to see the playback of this. Uh, Tim, what do you, what do you, give us the history. Give us the history of Tim making music. Well, uh, I grew up in Philadelphia, and um, I was born into a family of the youngest of four kids. Uh, father was a professional folk singer, oh. and he was uh, very instrumental in the folk music revival in the Philadelphia area. So to speak. Uh, yes. Instrumental in the well, yes. <laughs> My kind of joke. Sorry, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> no pun intended. But anyway, um, he, he started the Philadelphia Folk Festival and the Folk Song Society and um, wow. was the, one of the original owners of the main folk music venue in Philly called the Main Point. It was like a coffee house out in Bryn Mawr. And uh, so I grew up surrounded by music everywhere all the time. My father taught guitar to thousands of people, and um, everybody was learning guitar at that time in the 60s and 70s, yeah. and um, so I was just inundated, and, uh, and so I grew up playing music as well, uh, along with my uh, two sisters and brother, going to folk festivals all summer long and just doing all kinds of stuff like that. Did you play separately or together as a family? Uh, at that point, uh, mostly together, and then... Like the uh, Van Traps. Yeah, kind of okay. like, it was a little bit like that. Um, only better. Only better. Only not. <laughs> yeah, only not. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, uh, I remember there was, there was one folk festival that was amazing up in um, upstate New York, kind of near the Massachusetts-Vermont border, uh, called Fox Hollow. That was just absolutely magic. It was uh, amazing. It was run by uh, a family, kind of similar to ours, actually. That you mean ours that we have today? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Um, and... Um, uh, anyway, we, I remember getting up there, I think I was seven or something, and led people in a sing-along of Down in the Valley, and uh, me and my little ukulele, and uh, <coughs> my brother. Um, this did, is, did you bring a ukulele today? I didn't, I, I should have, oh. but um, my brother uh, sang The Desperado, I think, uh, and uh, in the middle of it, he forgot the words, and he got so mortified that he um, started crying and just like stopped and said it. You know, I forgot the words, and, and he never performed again. Whereas my two sisters and I continued to play, right. and um, so that was kind of sad. He's a great he turned into a nice guitarist, a jazz guitarist, and he just never has performed. Where was Tim jumping up on stage, going, "I got your back, brother! Come <laughs> well, on, let's my, go!" <laughs> my sister was feeding him the lines, but you know, it just was he just overwhelmed him at that moment. And yeah, was that you know, but um, and a traumatic. It was a traumatic. I imagine yeah, traumatic moment because also in those days, I can't. You didn't really. Not that you want to have a bad performance these days, but these days it's almost like it, it's almost a given where you can make mistakes and everybody will still love you. Yeah. I.e. Yeah. Lucinda Williams. No, we won't go there. But <laughs> I saw a concert where she was making, she kept making mistakes and the crowd just kept saying, it's okay, Lucinda, it's okay. And it's really an unusual atmosphere to see such a supportive audience of any yeah. live act. So I know what you're talking about, yeah. it being brutal, and especially in those days, you had to be more perfect than well, not. Well, I mean, this... Well, this, this an internalized perfection. Yeah, this yeah, guy, I mean, that. this audience was unbelievably supportive. It was all, like, sim it was... It was the warm, it was like one big family, that festival, even the audience. But, you know, he just felt like he couldn't screw up and did, and just, you know, that was that. But um, anyway, when I was, uh, I guess, 11, I, I got a close uh, look at um, 
a Scottish bagpiper whose kids were my age and did Highland dancing, Scottish Highland dancing. And I just got really enamored with the whole thing, and I'm part Scottish and Irish, and so decided to take that ball and run with it. And I learned Scottish bagpipes and Highland dancing, and then found out there was a such thing as the Irish pipes, which was very, very rare at the time. There's probably about a dozen people who played them in North America at the time, mm -hmm. around 1971. Wow. And, um, Seriously, a dozen people? That's yeah, about it. literally. And yeah. it was almost dying out completely. I mean, it, it was know. like going into computers in the late 70s. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> um, only so better. Um, Only better. <laughs> only not. <laughs> so okay. anyway, I, I, I just got completely enthralled with it. I started learning Gaelic, studying all the mythology and everything, and just went crazy about Irish culture. And um, never looked back. I went to Ireland several times. You know, when I was a kid, I was, yeah. you know, got very good very quickly because I was doing nothing else, you right. know, uh, and uh, then I, because there was almost no one doing it right. at that time, uh, I got to, you know, kind of a large blip on the radar at this point. Uh, you know, it's a really, it's a real shame, of course, you always do a lot of work uh, over at Cafe P and you mix sound and you do all sorts of stuff for us and it's a real shame and, and I think you're letting down the town by never bringing in any Irish music into this town. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really disappointed. Um, That's a joke. That is a joke. <laughs> I mean, if you knew Tim, like we know the Tim, you have. I want to say that you have uh, elevated the awareness of Irish music in this town. I would say you single-handedly almost have done that just by the, the sheer amount. You and Cafe P and I guess yeah. Steve, Jack, right. uh, from the amount of acts that come through Not here. Not just the amount, but the quality. And the quality, right? Yeah. I, I, was, I meant that too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. yeah. yeah, yeah she. You're I, I, you amazing at how you do that. What do what you? Where's your data base for uh, to be able to to conjure up all these acts that are coming through? In here, ah. the thing about Irish music is it really, even more than than most music, I would say it it's uh, it thrives on an informal social setting where people are playing music for themselves, not for performance sake whatsoever. And um, so, I.e. the Sunday afternoons. Exactly, that together, would be right? a, an example of a traditional session. And um, so when when I go out and play festivals, uh, the highlight is after the gig is over, and that's when you get together and you stay up till six in the morning playing tunes with your friends that you see at all the festivals. So there's this worldwide community, of course, based in places like Ireland and Chicago and Boston, Philadelphia, New York, primarily in the bigger Irish communities, but also at this point it's everywhere. I mean, I know. People in Japan who play Irish music, I, you know, it's just everywhere, and uh, and we all know each other. I mean, not all of us, but a lot of us really do know each other, yeah. and um, and we play with each other, you know, around, you know, when we travel around, and uh, it's a wonderful, you know, extended family, and so it's much it's like the family we have here today. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Once again. Um, <clears throat> we're a family-oriented thing here. Uh, well, I have a point where I'm going with this. We'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's, uh, you know, that's basically how it works. And, and the, the, the other missing piece in this conversation so far is that when I got involved in Irish music was just when it was starting to take off like a rocket. It just went nuts. It was almost unheard of before maybe, well, certainly before the Clancy Brothers hit the scene in the late 50s. Right. right. But, um, Who I love. I, I love them. <laughs> well, they kind the of started it Irish off. In fact, they kind of started the whole folk music revival in a sense that they, they made it possible. They, were, they, they showed that it was possible to take ethnic music and um, be successful, wildly successful at it. Uh, and the country reacted really strongly to it. I mean, absolutely. and I know that they also were very popular in Irish uh, communities in the country, in, in this country, especially New York. Mm -hmm. uh, the Carnegie Hall concert, I think, is one of the great uh, records, um, especially, I guess, in Irish music. But I think of, not of all time, I don't want to make that statement, but it's one of the more memorable records from the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, I, I, you know, can, let's, move on, let's move on to George, uh, George Foster. Name across the screen, George Foster. Uh, the reason, let me, let me first cut in with an explanation with the whole, the family here. The reason why I say that is that in Fairfield in particular, it seems like there's a family atmosphere. Look at, look at the three people okay, before us. We're all kind of hanging out and it's like, we all know each other from going to Cafe B, talking to each other, down off of ledges. Um, <laughs> that would be me. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, especially this lady here. So, uh, you, I, be, I wouldn't, in other words, I'm thanking you. Let's be more clear about this. Uh, <laughs> Sharon and I have had a, a close relationship lately, and it's really interesting because I've been here about two years uh, doing the, the shows on crew, and we've just branched out into this. And 
It's sort of like, what took, what took this so long, you know? And in the same way, it's like with relationships in town. Um, I'm very sensitive to that. I'm, 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 I'm needy right now. And I feel, but what's great is that the whole community, I look at the musicians in this community. We've had almost n nothing but young people on this show. We've, uh, and we've had a couple of grown-ups, as I like to say, like Tom. Um, but uh, this is the first show where we have all adults, all grown-ups. And I'm all adults all the time. All adults all the time. Not for them kids, them little brats. No kidding. Uh, but I love the uh, I love the camaraderie. There's a camaraderie in town among the musicians where it really is. I know it's corny to say it's a family atmosphere, but it seems like everybody regrew up with each other here. Everybody's had intimate musical moments with each other. It may not have been intimate moments, but on that level where everybody's always, always. You have to underline that ten times. Playing on each other's stuff and with each other live and hanging out together, drinking coffee and all of that, that's a family, I think. Uh, and I, I'm, I witness that and I get a little envious <laughs> because I really haven't, been, I haven't submerged myself into that as much as I, I would have loved to have. But um, that's why I say we, the Fairfield has a musical family and it's nice to have um, uh, you guys here because I really identify with, with y'all. Okay, enough of that. Uh, <laughs> I, forgive me for going on about that. I just I think that's a quality that's really sweet in this town, almost yes. over others. Can you think of any other town that does that? Well, I think in like what Tim was saying about Irish music, there are, are musical communities that are similar, um, genre-based kind of. Mm -hmm. But as far as across the board, this is a special place, certainly. We, yeah. We're very blessed to be here. Yeah, blues, rock, jazz, um, uh, Progressive Irish. jazz, Irish. Um, also, everything just melds pop, uh, uh, punk, alternative. Yeah. We've got it all here, Orange and everybody right. respects each other's <clears throat> level of expertise. Right. And, they, and and it, it almost seems like there is, isn't very much mentorship really going on between our age group, let's say, um, well, although some of you are younger than I, I understand. But um, but the but between our age group and the kids, the kids have really decided to take it on their own and just do their own thing. And I really appreciate that. I really respect them for that. Like the beauty shop, we have a beauty shop that I've been hawking for uh, a few of the for the episodes. What is your take, George? We're going to get to your story, I promise. But I just wanted to finish up this thought. What is your take about the interaction between the young and the old musicians in town? What is what is in your eye is the is the sort of how do you look at that those dynamics? How do, would you explain the 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 relationship. I'm internally grappling with old musician. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, none of us are really old. And the funny thing is, you're no, right it's on. good. It's good. Um, I think it's awesome, and I personally am am looking forward to more interaction between the beauty shop and you know folks that are have more experience under their belts. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the residency program that they have there is amazing. Yeah bringing in artists, and a lot of them are in their 20s and early 30s. And um, it's an incredible resource, all of these artists coming through. If you explain that, you know about the residency program here, right? All right do you want to go into two, two lines of it for someone who... Just that the, the, the beauty shop has created a residency program where they bring in touring working artists who then spend a month here and are supported to create a new work, whether it's writing new songs or creating a new animation or whatever it is that they're doing and they're they're housed and fed for a month here and then in return they offer workshops or one-on-one -on -one, uh, work with different people who would like to create an animation or write a song or whatever their specialty is. Right. And it's a wonderful give and take for the community. I really encourage people to take advantage of it. It's, it's an incredible deal, ten dollars a month and you can support touring working artists and this whole idea that it, you know an entire community can be involved in fostering the arts here. So I'm a big fan of the whole beauty shop thing and what they're doing there. I think it's awesome. Me too. And yeah. uh, they would give the ten dollars, I guess, directly to the the beauty shop folks, right? right? That's right. Okay. Uh, speaking of fostering things, oh, go ahead. Fostering things, I'm all about that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the beauty shop has a website, and you can just go there and find out how uh, to sponsor this uh, residency program. Nice. When the kids find out the amount of time we took, <laughs> they're going to be really happy. It's nice. Um, I, I love, uh, George, I, you, I've seen you in so many configurations at this point, backing up other people, just jumping up on the stage and jamming, yeah. and uh, et cetera. Uh, tell me about, let's go into, tell us about your, your background, too. Well, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, for, first I'd like to say, like you mentioned about, I've played with a number of people. I've, I've played with both of these wonderful, illustrious uh, heroes of mine, yes. and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. 
with you guys, really humbling, in fact. Um, and the, uh, gosh, I, I've probably played probably every style I can think of while I've lived in Fairfield. Yeah. Um, be, being a bass player, it's kind of easy to fit in a lot of times. Uh, but your particular style, even though, like I said earlier, you were oh, humble, no. and I'm, I'm like, you jump on a stage, and I'm like, hmm. And then all of a sudden you start playing, and I'm like, <laughs> so, well, thanks for that. Incredible. Well, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, well, as far as getting started, uh, I, I started out uh, singing um, as probably I was about eight, and uh, I sang with my younger brother Chuck and my other younger younger brother uh, Roger, who uh, about three years younger than about about a year younger, and um, we sang uh, Dixie. We were in this mm -hmm. resort hotel in North Carolina. And we, uh, it was dinner hour and uh, at this resort. And they put us on a stage and we'd rehearsed a little while. And we went up there and we sang Dixie. And, uh, and I got the bug then, I think. Um, <laughs> How old were you again? About eight. About eight. Probably, yeah. I think the youngest was about five. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, um, when, when, the, uh, when the hormones start coming in, then I got a drum set. And I was doing drums, you know, like 12 or something. And I uh, got tired of drums and then picked up a guitar and was playing that and I learned all those cards, uh, all the chords back in those days, uh, in those days were about three chords per song, right. uh, about around 19, whatever that was, 60, uh, 6, 7. Uh, so it was really easy to learn a lot of songs. Uh, and then I felt that I'd hit my limit and some friend of mine had a bass and uh, it was so exotic. I mean, these big thick strings, it's like if you pluck them and they would vibrate your body. <laughs> and uh, I just thought, this is next. And uh, so I, I was able to borrow basses for a long time. And then I finally bought one, a t terrible cheap, <laughs> never buy, listen to me, never buy a Kent bass. Oh, <laughs> uh, wait a minute, young man. Uh, my King Carol stamp books bought me my first guitar, which was a Kent uh, guitar that I, I was in uh, fourth grade, fifth grade. And then uh, I had the wisdom of painting the front of it green. <laughs> my Kent bass had feedback problems. <laughs> to give you an idea about uh, oh they were space. terrible instruments if, if I didn't Kent. stand just right if I didn't stand just right I had microphone feedback I mean that high pitched humming in your ear is awful microphone feedback so anyway uh, long story short uh, my younger brother Chuck uh, learned the guitar my other younger brother Roger learned the drums and while we were still teens we started like falling in love with Mahavishnu Orchestra uh, and the Chick Corea stuff uh, Return yeah, to Forever expensive. There we go. And some King Crimson. Mm -hmm. And so we learned and learned and learned and practiced and practiced and played awfully. But we were really having a lot of fun learning this jazz fusion thing. Yeah. You know, like your chops yeah. is everything. Yeah. So it was really, really fun. And my heroes at that time were probably what the, the big bass hero guys, uh, Jack Bruce uh, and uh, what John Entwistle and... Uh, what about Stanley Clark? Or that came later. That was, yeah, Stanley Clark and, yeah. um, gosh, Jaco Pistorius. Were you yeah. a Tony Levin fan, by the way, ever? Oh, still am. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, big fan. So, uh, anyway, that kind of, you know, I never took lessons. I, I was all self-taught. I would just listen to things and learn them and uh, make a lot of mistakes, and I still do, and that's just the way it is. You make no mistakes. <laughs> make no mistake. He makes no mistakes. <laughs> well, thank you. I've learned how to correct mistakes in real time. <laughs> there Let's say that. That that works. Work. That's, 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 that's what I do. Friends with a friend. like, mm. That's a skill <laughs> I learned. <laughs> yeah, it's a skill. It actually is. But anyway... Uh, and I've, I've, had, uh, I've had the pleasure to play in a lot of bands, uh, a lot of bands. Uh, there's a local band here that was formed in the 90s called Bamboo, which uh, mm -hmm. made a big presence in Fairfield and then made a big presence in Iowa City. And then we basically broke up, as uh, bands always do seem to do. So, uh, but now Why? we get together <laughs> Now we get together once a year, uh, roughly, for uh, a reunion show. People come in back from New York, back from Chicago. And we get together and we play, and we'll be doing another show this uh, June. Oh, nice. Uh, in Iowa City at the Pet Mall on Friday night. Recording a project, perhaps, during the uh, live? Oh, record. God. Yeah. It would be so, we wrote everything we play. And uh, it's all original, and we had so much fun, and we made so much music. And we recorded one, two, well, one real album, and then the other one was kind of, uh, what, how do you say, a little early-ish. Okay. I mean, we shouldn't have. Anyway, bottom line is you learn. You learn it was more. the forced second album. From yes, the it was the soft, sophomore album that maybe should have waited. Oh, and they call it right the sophomore jinx, of course. The, the jinx. That's another one. The jinx, yes. Uh, so anyway, I've done that. And then uh, <coughs> lately, more lately, I'm playing with uh, Tom Morgan. Who? Um, <laughs> Tom, Tom Morgan and I have a, a, a country blues duo uh, playing that old, old time uh, blues and uh, uh, Piedmont finger picking stuff. So modeled after Hot Tuna. 
Uh, another hero of mine, Jack Cassidy. Yeah. We came this close to getting an interview with him over at Crew. Yeah. Uh, win some, you lose some. That close. That would have been me. Uh, that was a, that's, that's really sweet. And that your band with Tom is, uh, you, you guys play a lot. And you do have a CD. We do. Um, are you, how do you, how do you look at, how do you balance your music, musical desires with those of playing music with Tom and, and, you know, and going on the road with him and all that? Mm -hmm. I mean, because you do have two different lives with that. Right. Yeah, it's a hobby. I mean, I'm not full-time. Uh, I was full-time when I was about 19. I spent about a year, maybe two, uh, making a living at it, uh, yeah, as, such as it was. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, back in Ohio, where I'm from. And, uh, in a, by the way, it was a great big horn band. We did a lot of Tower of Power and <coughs> Chicago and oh, nice. uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears and that kind of power power music. Did you get to see the Tower of Power concert? A lot. Recently? Well, no, recently, I mean. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you, well, uh, I went to St. Louis last year and so. Yeah. And got to hobnob with Rocco, another one of my heroes. Oh, cool. In fact, I tried to sell Rocco a bass back in, like, 1975. <laughs> Have I got a bass for you? I did. <laughs> Michael, come here. You'll appreciate this. It was, it was a, a head face. Right? No, it was like <laughs> Oh my God. Uh, actually, you know how it is when. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Anyway, I ended up with a vintage 1954 precision bass, oh. which is worth today probably. I hate to think, but probably twenty five thousand dollars. That's uh, like my, my old Partridge Family memorabilia, but go on. Oh. <laughs> so I thought, you know what? I want to sell this bass to Jocko. He'll appreciate it, oh and God. then it would just be so much fun for me. Not for twenty five thousand. To Jocko. To, oh, I'm sorry, Rocco. Rocco, Rocco Jocko, one of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I did. I, I he played in Columbus, and I got a chance to you know hang around behind and get him afterwards and all that. And I told him I had this bass, and he he allowed me to come to the hotel and I showed it to him and blah blah, and he didn't buy it. So, <laughs> but Jocko did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now some some, some Jack Lynn, some, some friend of mine who's a guitar player. I think I sold it to him for like two hundred and fifty dollars or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> You know, it's like one of those, like I was Ouch. just a kid. I, don't I, know. I, I once owned a Farfisa organ, mm -hmm. uh, and had I kept it, I was in the 70s, and had I kept it just a few more years during the Elvis Costello phases and thing, and, and you know, what, what was it, B-52s and all that, oh my God, it, you know, especially, I had a vintage one too. Yeah. Oh gosh. I, oh well. Wow. Yeah, yeah, collector, the collector mentality, right, let's, let's, <laughs> I had comic books, I had, like I said before, Partridge Family memorabilia, I, was, uh, I had the 69 Mets and the, I had the, uh, all of the trading cards from that year, oh. uh, because I was such a baseball fan during, in 1969, of course, I was in New York, but, um, when you think of the memorabilia and think of musical instruments, vintage musical instruments and all of that, and there's a certain point where it gets to be neurotic. In other words, like mm. you can't keep it. I have a Gibson Dove, but I don't have an original Gibson Dove. I have a, 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 a remake. Uh, it's done the same way that the original was done, but it's a remake. And I feel less um, obligated to keep it in the kind of condition had I had the original. And I'm grateful to not have the original. You know, mm. it's like that's a, that's its whole. It would have ne it would I, I would have needed an extension on the house to put the, the, that in to have the right you know yep. humidity. Uh, humidity and all that. So. In a way, I'm kind of glad I didn't do that. But but the love of you know the love of these things, and mm -hmm. especially when they're good instruments, is 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 there anything like that? I mean, like our relationship with an instrument. Uh, you brought a couple today, um, Sharon, because we're going to have a little music in a while. Um, what do you? What is the? You you have a different. You have a very holistic and uh, uh, an expanded take. On the relation of, of how consciousness works and energy works in music and, and, and in life, you you're not just a musician and a great singer, but you also have all these other elements that are going on where you're applying elements like I said, consciousness, energy, the healing, all of that into your mix. Um, as you, you are, you just as we all are. As we all are, how I conscious guess, are we? Right, I guess we're being conscious in what we're doing. That's right, and no, and I get. Oh, let's get to that bigger picture. But my question was really a little more singular. <laughs> my say, it's with the instruments, the relationship between a a, a player and their instrument. Um, can you just can you go into that a little bit? Because there's something sure. very very unique and special about it. It's like <clears throat> I think anybody who who's been playing has that experience of picking up an, a guitar or whatever your your tool of your trade is. And having it, you know, as soon as you put your hands on it, that this one is mine. It has my name on it. Yeah. And there's something about it, having been alive, that it, it's made of wood and that it takes on some of your energy. I swear, if you play an instrument long enough, it takes on a bit of your essence. Nice. And so that being the case, they become very, they become like your children, you know. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. They become like your children. I'm looking because my guitars are to my left. That's why I'm looking over there. But uh, yeah, um, so I think that a large part of it is just the fact that they're made of wood and that it a, was a living thing and that it sort of takes in parts of you as you play them more. All right, now I want to get to the to this. Uh, you're a songwriter. Mm -hmm. You're a songwriter, and you're a songwriter. I mean, you, you all have a catalog, catalogs of your own music. Yeah, uh, Sharon, with you, I heard you. My favorite thing that I've ever heard you sing, mainly because of the probably the experience of sitting down with you at Cafe P and 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 just being with you while I was listening to this, like right here, like as close as this. Right. right. Um, was you doing a version of uh, Hallelujah, right. Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah? Or as like most people like to say, Jeff Beck, Jeff Buckley's a hallelujah. Um, but uh, you took on when you did that. When I was listening to the recording, there was a talk about energies. There was a, it, it felt like there was something going on pushing you. And I, we talked about it. There was there were emotional there were things going on relationship things or whatever were at the time right. that absolutely were were affecting the read. Absolutely. But there's also but there was another energy going on in there that was different than any other kind of vocal that I've ever heard you you sing. Right. Can you can you elaborate? It's sort of like maybe the bigger picture. Maybe the best question with this is um, is when you're singing different songs, do you find yourself absorbing or projecting different kinds of energies, or is it coming from the like one uh, the same source, and you're expressing you're expressing from that source that one? Um, um, Oh, are you being inspired from the, from that one spot all the time, or is it different? Or are there different things inspiring your performances and creativity? <clears throat> wow. That's a big one, I know, I know, sorry. Yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm thinking that it, it might be different when I'm doing original material than when I'm doing covers, but I don't know that that's really true. I, I have to think to it, but um, I when I'm doing way. original material, there is, uh, there is the sense of where you were or where I was when I was writing it and what was informing that and where it was coming from if there were life events or something I overheard or a, a place, a feeling for a place or whatever was going on at the time that um, a lyric is written. And um, there's a sense of going, of being back in that place where it was written. So if you're writing from a horrible relationship experience, then guess what? You get to live that all over again. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> and there's some level of, you know, wanting to to express fully in the emotion of where that came from. And then there's the I don't want to completely fall apart on stage level of things. So <laughs> there's this fine yeah. line that you're sort of walking this line where you want to express, but I, for me, this is just my experience. But sometimes I'm I'm sort of you know, wondering who's going to mop me up off the floor. Where, it, in the experience of doing Hallelujah, mm -hmm. um, Tim and I, I quoted that with Tim at his studio. And what a coincidence! Yes, and um, that was a truly clean Sharon and Tim off the floor after that recording. It was a it was a powerful, was very very powerful yes. thing because I was I was very much ripped open by all different aspects of my life. I felt very as if my skin were made of cellophane. I didn't feel very, um, uh, felt really vulnerable. And so when I went in, I just, you know, made a decision. The heck with it. I'm just going to not put any limitations on this and see what happens. And if there's some part of our minds sometimes where if you're singing, there's a there can be a concern. If I go to that place, I don't know what's going to happen. And I'm not sure that I'm safe here to go there and find out what's going to happen if I go there. And especially in so, front of an audience. I mean, right. that gets, like you said. Right. Yeah. So in this case, I was ready. I've been feeling this transition coming on in my music. I sort of I stopped touring. I, I started uh, reassessing the business in general for me and where I wanted to go in this next phase of things. And um, everything was changing in my life. And so it was time to kind of reassess. And part of that process was then taking this song, which I've always had a strong affinity for. And part of me was going, you don't want to record Hallelujah. A million people recorded Hallelujah. Good Lord, you're just going to be just another person who's recorded this song. But I thought, I went into the studio. I didn't even tell Tim what I was coming in to record. I just had to record that day. And when I got there, it was that song. And we did it. And it was, um, it was part of this transition that I feel like I'm in right now from, you know, all artists grow if you're, you know, if you're a true artist and you're being true to your vision, you continue to change your work and grow. And I feel 
in a certain way, I've been a little bit safe for a little while, and I want to not be safe. I want to, you yes. know, break it. And so this was a step in that, a really real step that is actually I can give to somebody and go listen to this step in my progress of opening up as an artist. So yeah, I'm I, really happy with that recording. And I was really, I was really happy and complimented that you you wanted me to hear that. Yeah, I was yeah. sitting at the table, and here you are giving me that, and I didn't know what to expect. It was like, here, just listen. Right. <laughs> Whatever, however that was, right. it was very innocent, but it was very sweet. And I loved your first comment. <clears throat> oh, not this song. You recorded <laughs> this song. I'm like, just shut up and listen. <laughs> <laughs> but you know why? I mean, seriously, like you said, like a you million said earlier, people. a million people have recorded this song, and I'm, I'm like, oh my God, here we go. Um, but on the other hand, as you got into that, and as it got more intense, and as you were doing more, more oh, you know, this interpretation, I'm like, oh my God, how do you top that? Well, there's the next verse. That's how you top that. And it just kept coming. It was unbelievable. Um, and I encouraged her at that time, why don't you do a whole album like this right now? Just do it. Just go. Now, I know you have another creative vision for that. Um, I have a I have a sort of producer's background, so my first my first thought and a, and a management back not a management background but advice A and R uh, I, I used to give advice to people. So one of the one of the things I thought instantly from that really was that a whole project of that kind of, of what yeah. you did on that right. with that kind of I mean even if it was that type of it was if you're saying it's it was a very uh, uh, really make a, a a bam like a real expressive yes. you know bolt a whole album of that mm -hmm. would be interesting. And it is interesting for me to, I mean, that is something I would love to do. Yeah. Right now I'm somewhat committed in a different direction, but it doesn't mean that that, you know, can't happen too. I, I yeah. want to do that. Do you know why? One of the reasons why is that you just kept upping yourself on that recording, and I was thinking, well, what else you got? This is the one recording. <laughs> this is the one recording. Now all of a sudden if you have like a collection of 10 to 12 songs, which are going to up the other ones? Right. You know, yeah, this right. is like, oh, this could go everywhere. Right. So anyway, that's that's why I suggest, uh, it's a good I'm thought. saying that. I'm, I'm, I'm on that train with you there. I would love it. Now, you guys, what, never played together or have played together often? We've played together. I haven't played with George enough. It's been a while. But um, we did a project. We did some shows together. And uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I had, for years, worked in a duo with a fretless bassist. It is one of my favorite accompanying instruments to open tunings on the guitar. Yeah. And so that, that combination is like heaven to me when I... I Put myself back at the Man Music Center in Philly mm. in the third row, and Joni Mitchell Jaca. was playing in the Shadows and Light tour, and I was watching mm. her play with Jaco Pistorius and and Don Elias and um, yeah. Pat Metheny, and I mean that band, and I I was like this this is heaven. I'm here. I you know I made it. My only my only thought about that Shadows and Light tour, if we're gonna have like little off <laughs> side you know sidebars, is that I wish the material had been different. I wish the material had been a little bit more. I wish it wasn't the sort of, you know, what she had done towards the later. I wish she had visited, revisited some of the earlier stuff. Um, I in just, addition, like for instance, there was stuff off of for the. I mean, even for the roses, hissing of summer lawns. I think she did two songs, right? right. Then, and she did. Um, but it was sort of like she took Hagira. I never pronounced it right. Hagira. On and it was like, uh, yeah, kind of wish she visited for the roses. Even for the roses, had right. such an amazing. Do you know what? Room. When you have a catalog like hers and the progression that she made, and again, talk about an artist honoring their yeah. where they are. I mean, yeah. she did things like Wild Things Run Fast, and then she had her Gira phase, and then she had the really early, very pure stuff like Blue. All there's such an amazing range of her experience as a growing artist. I, I just you know it's a huge. I have to tell you, now that everybody's like, oh, Skrillex crazy. Oh, it's Skrillex. He's the best thing ever. Give him 12 uh, Grammy Awards. Uh, this whole phase we're going through with the... Uh, I don't mean to be that cynical. I like, I do like Skrillex. I will, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it on for enjoyment, but when I'm hearing it on in the background, I, I love it. I think it's kind of very cool. But um, uh, the reason why I'm saying that, I don't want to come off like old guy, but I do want to say that old, but I do want to say there's an authenticity, there's a... An organic nature, which of course he doesn't care about in that music. That what he's going for is that, eh, and I'm talking about that loud too. It's like yeah. the real aggressive sounds because it's almost like it's almost like he's bridging <clears throat> greater, really good musical arrangements with synthesizer with um, punk. It, the punk element being, I'm going to make this as nasty as I feel yeah. like it. Uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, that 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 F word, you uh, everybody, because it's, it's like a reaction. it's just just to stir right. It's exactly to stir you up, and and he does it, but he, and he also does it in a way that's like it just makes you want to have fun. On the other hand, I feel like this year, even though he got three Grammys and whatever, uh, they were off camera. Those were off camera camera Grammy uh, presentations. Whereas Adele was like, what? She got six Grammys. Everything she was nominated for plus 
Uh, the producer got the uh, a Grammy for the album. Right. And I think, and what happened was, there was something that was being said, I think, this year. Yes, Dead Mouse, yes, Skrillex, yes, all of these very cool progressive acts, and, you know, of course, Rihanna and um, uh, uh, Coldplay and all that. All these great things that were happening this year that proving that finally the Grammys have met the, the era that they're in, as opposed to all the old fogies vote, voting for, like, you know, hey, let's have Steely Dan win another award. <laughs> but um, I, my feeling is that Adele made a... Adele is not the, a, an old fogey. Adele is a young woman who's taking music from a different approach. She's taking it from an organic approach. And... Uh, you can't deny it. It isn't just a bunch of old people voting for an Adele. You can't deny those records. Um, the, the one that kept getting you know, over and over to the Grammys, but, but my favorite on that record was uh, uh, Rumor Has It. Rumor Has It takes me not only back to like the 60s girl groups, uh, but it is, it is an exquisite record to me. I listen to that and I go, when they were in the studio making that, did they understand their genius that was going into that? And I think that that was that versus... That will live longer. Those arrangements and her vocal expression and those songs, because you can clearly hear what's going on, and that will live longer, I think. It's extraordinary that she's you know, 19 to 21, 22 years old. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's amazing. Yes. And it's amazing. Well, and, she's, and, she's flag, and she's flag carrying yeah. for like a sound and a thing that people appreciate it. It's like when it gets right down to it, what are you identifying with? It was, I think in that way, it was a bit of a, it was a bit of, if it wasn't a snub towards, you know, ooh, we got to have the latest technology, technology, technology. Uh, it was more of a, well, it gets down to the basics. It's how you feel. Can I, can I stir your heart a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, and I really loved that about it. And uh, uh, all of you represent, you know, what we're talking about as far as heart value, whether it be Irish music, whether it be some, it be some of the, the, the fusion-y things that you've added to other people. I didn't want to say the word fusion earlier, but that's sort of what I, you know, what I felt like, I feel like you add a lot of times to other mm -hmm. people's works when I hear you play with other people. And you've got a, you've got a natural jazz bend that I'm not sure you don't play into you don't play into it as not much anymore. as I did, but I, oh, I don't you go. so That's... much anymore. Okay. After I went to Austin and and lived in in Texas for a little while and had that kind of influence come in, and then you know other things since then, it's just uh, I didn't quite focus so much on that modal, you know, jazzy sort of thing yeah. as I used to. And it can be hard to follow. I mean, yeah, it's it's right? a hard. It's sort of like you have to be thinking in a, yeah. in a lot of times as yeah. opposed to just feeling for That's some right. for some. For and uh, uh, I. Uh, I wanted to ask you guys, since we talked about the beauty shop earlier, we talked about the kids. Um, love the kids. Uh, what if, I always ask this question of like the artists, and I also ask it of everybody that comes here now. Almost everybody. I think I've forgotten a couple of times. What advice might you guys have for new artists? That's easy. And don't, you can even think about Fairfield if you want to. Yeah, don't buy a Ken. <laughs> don't buy a Ken. I can give that advice to you. I hated that guitar. Actually, oh my God. Actually, he's got a point there, though. A really good instrument yeah. makes a huge, huge difference. Yeah. yeah. Huge difference. Don't buy a cheap instrument. If you know you're going to play, I mean, there is value in, okay, I'm not sure whether I'm actually going to follow through with this, and therefore mom's buying you the $250 guitar rather than the $2,000 guitar. But if you, um, if you feel like this is my thing, then have a good instrument in your hands. It makes more difference than almost anything else as far as your pleasure and your enjoyment and how good you sound, and therefore you're inspired, and therefore you play more, and therefore, you know, it's a beautiful loop. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I think a couple of things come to mind. Um, and George, we're coming of, back to you. You're not done yet. Young. <laughs> <laughs> bouncing off of what you said, in, in a sense, about the, the <laughs> kind of valuing, you know, good quality in general. I think that um, there's a tendency to think that if something exists at all, it's good enough. Like if it, you know, get it from Walmart, it's good enough. You know, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, but, That's right. Uh, That's true. So that that relates to instruments, like you were just mentioning, but it also relates to recording quality. Uh, you know, I'm an engineer, and these days people are always wanting to do things themselves with stuff they get for next to nothing because it's made in China. You know, a whole recording studio that costs less than three hundred dollars, including <laughs> microphones and stands and cables. You know, and thinking that oh, I can make a record now, and that's great. It should be made use of because the joy is that you can do it at all. But to think that that's real professional quality or that your music somehow doesn't deserve better because it's yours <laughs> or, it's, you know, some, there's some kind of weird mixture. Yeah. I can do I it myself mean. and I'm not worth really valuing. And, and the people who actually are promoting real value or are really valuable are those people on stage instead of me. Um, you know the good it's a double edged sword it, the 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 fact is that good quality is more available than ever it used to be that it wasn't available at all except to the very few you know who were able to get contracts 
now anybody can record. And if you put a little bit more into it, just like anybody can get an instrument, you can invest a little bit more and get something that's actually better in terms of an instrument or your recording, or, or just simply valuing it, valuing your music, uh, putting the time in. You know, there's a lot of, there's so much emphasis on uh, commercialization these days and, and consumerism and having to make the money mm -hmm. in order to afford, you know, afford that consumerist uh, lifestyle that uh, people don't, you know, value art. Art, art you know, uh, departments are closing down in schools, things like that. Music art departments, departments are, yeah, are closing down in record companies, <laughs> what's left of record companies. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So there's yeah, all kinds just... of places where that's happening. So to kind of buck the system in a way and... And realize that you, you know, that your your art, your feeling level, what you have to get, no matter how technically uh, advanced it is, uh, either as a player or anything else, is it's still worth investing in and, and giving it its its uh, time to breathe. But uh, George, I think, yeah, I think that uh, if 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 someone has a an inclination to make music, then that's coming from the inside. It's this spark from inside. And it's easy to get frustrated when the outside isn't reflecting what's inside. You know, like, like my technique isn't good, mm -hmm. uh, basically. You know, I, why can't I? And I, it sounds like crap. And uh, the advice, I'd say that's probably more common than anything else. And uh, the advice is to not give up. Uh, the people who became great are those who didn't give up. Persistence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing, the reward is there. It's just, it's not there necessarily right away. Right. I'm I just, say, why don't I sound like, you know, well, yeah. just keep at it. I just wish I, the environment now more than ever. I, I was working with an artist briefly, um, allegedly managing, but the problem I felt was that one of the things that I knew that this poor kid was going to have to go through at some point was uh, label deal or not. He was going to have to shine through a field of endless, endless artists now, and everybody's a star on YouTube for you know ten minutes or whatever. How do you fight that? How do you, how, it's not like, uh, this is a, I had a good old days, you, you know. No, I meant more like, I mean more like, how do you, how do you, how do you make yourself more of a, a permanent, have a permanent presence, make yourself significant and your messages and all that. My feeling is those days might really be gone. So you're going to have to get into this for reasons other than fame, I think, or, or yeah, fame and fortune. You're mm -hmm. going to have to get into this, sort of as you're saying, from the spark within, from the, love from the energy and the love of the music, for the, from the... Um, I don't know that you linger and, and you, you continue and you do persevere if you're in it for some um, but kids are external going to get success over, over a period of time. At first, of course, we all wanted that's to right. all of that yes. at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, that's the admission. But, uh, I mean, that's really yeah, the sure. confession. Sure, yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, what it turns everything into. is changing. Yeah, and everything has changed in the last ten years or so in the business. So, um, even the fact that uh, as a an acoustic or, or a, using the F word, a folk musician, <laughs> that I was I traveling like that around. Word. I still like that word. <laughs> Four letter word. That I've come back to liking it, but for a while there, I was, I didn't want to be a folk artist. But in any case, I used to travel and and play and made it work at a certain level. I wasn't nice. hugely successful, but I did you know, make my living as it were as a as a musician and um, a lot of it had to do with CD sales. You'd sell mm -hmm. CDs at all yeah. your shows and now yeah. that with that being so decimated by, yeah. you know, downloads, downloads and, and music piracy. should be free and Yeah, music know. should be free. Yeah. Said the I, person who didn't write the song. Yes, or <laughs> sell right. the sell the song. That's right. All right. You know what? Let's so that we have some time. Those are all beautiful answers, by the way. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for being here today on Fairfield 2.0. Um, but I really loved the fact that it was you guys, because you are some of my favorite musicians in town. I say that all the time, and I don't mean to. Do I, I do say that a lot. Don't I? Jason Strong was in back of the camera there. Um, <laughs> he's nodding. He's like, Ugh. Um, But I, I want to get, I want to shut up, and I, will, and I would love to have you guys sing a song, if that's possible, uh, if you feel like it. You feel like, can you guys do a song together? Together. Together. Wow, maybe. Okay. okay. We'll figure something out. <clears throat> Let's do that. Okay. So we'll just do the formal goodbyes right now. Hello and goodbye, Fairfield. Uh, this was Fairfield 2.0, Mike Ragonia. This was Tim Britton. This was George Foster. Still is, still is. Um, and you're <laughs> my Sharon favorite Fisk. talk show host, by the way. <laughs> you are. Harry, you're an excellent interviewer. Uh, We're glad uh, you're here. No. No. Uh, See, you know what, Milky Miss? I love <laughs> Thank This you. is Sharon Bousquet. I'm sorry. I said that over. Sharon Bousquet, the lovely Sharon Bousquet. So thank you all for coming here, and let's, let's do a song now.
Goodbye, Fairfield. We're going to get you on the show someday, so don't think you're out of the, out of the fray here. This is We All Fall Down. It's about those times when you're laying on the ground going, crap. So <laughs> this is what the ant's eye view looks like. <laughs> Praise is holy to the name.